Welcome to the N1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host as always, Marcus Sadu, and today we've got John Berardi on the show. So John is the co-founder of a company called Precision Nutrition, which is the largest nutritional coaching company in the world. And over the last 15 years, he's worked with companies like Apple, Equinox, Nike, Titleist, the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA, Carolina Panthers in the NFL, UFC champion George St. Pierre. So the list goes on here. He's super knowledgeable around nutrition, of course, and training and stuff like that. But the primary reason I wanted to have him on the podcast is because I just really like the way his brain works, the way that he portrays information, thoughts, ideas, and all that sort of stuff. So I just sort of picked his brain on some random topics that I'm interested in and I've heard him talk about in the past. Now I will say that there are a couple moments in this interview where the audio goes just a tad bit tinny, but 98% of it sounds amazing. So I hope you guys enjoy this interview, this wide ranging interview with John Berardi. So for the folks who may not be familiar with you and your work, how did you get into all of this health and fitness stuff to begin with? Uh, There's people out there unfamiliar with my work. Oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> there are like uh, two or three folks. <laughs> um, no. No, so, you know, basically, I, I, most people will know me as the co founder of Precision Nutrition. So, um, Precision Nutrition has become, become the, the world's, world's largest, largest nutrition, nutrition coaching, coaching uh, certification, certification, and software, software company. company. So, um, um, you know, over the last couple of decades, we've coached a couple hundred thousand people. Uh, all distance based through the web. We're, we're basically the world's largest coaching intervention. We have more data than anyone else ever has collected on body transformation. Um, we parlayed that into an education program for professionals. So health and fitness professionals, whether that's personal trainers or nutritionists or functional medicine doctors, and that's become the largest nutrition certification in the world. And we've certified over a hundred thousand people now. And then we put the two together a couple years back, creating a nutrition coaching software that uses the technology that we use in our coaching, um, for our professionals to use with their clients. So that, that's basically had been my career for a very long time. And that's what most people would know me as. And, uh, how, how I, I got, got into, into that, that was, um, I, I mean, mean starting, starting way, way back, back when, when I was little, little you know, and, and this is what, what I talk about with some of my new work. work. Um, the, the idea, idea that, that whatever field or career or profession or vocation we've chosen, usually if, if it's something we're excited and passionate about traces back to some kind of superhero origin story. Um, and mine wasn't, I was a athlete or involved in physical activity growing up. Mine was the opposite. I was born preemie. I was really sick. I had asthma and allergies and I was skinny and weak and all these things. And so for me, um, discovering health and fitness and strength training and nutrition and, um, recovery and rest and, um, even sort of the mental things that go around with these, um, was something very novel when I, uh, was a late teenager. And, um, because I was a preemie and introverted and didn't do sports and stuff, I used to read a lot. So that was my entry into this. I was reading things about how, you know, working out and eating well could help with some of the, some of the health issues I was having and some of the self-esteem, frankly, issues I had, cause I was small and skinny. Um, and so that, you know, as I read about it, I was like, wow, I want to try some of these things. And then that sort of became the launching point for my personal interest. And then um, when I finally went to university and you had to pick your major and all that, I just kept taking all these courses in uh, all my electives in like exercise science and nutrition. You know, I, I come from an immigrant family, so you have to be a doctor or a lawyer. So I was on track to be a doc. Um, and I was, I did pre-med and, but all my electives were in this fun side area interest of mine. And so that became when it came time to go on to school after undergrad, uh, I applied to med schools. I was going to go, but then I, at the last minute was like, but I don't think I'll like this as much as exercise and nutrition. So I went really deep there and I, I did a master's and I did a PhD and, um, the, through that process, I realized I just, I love helping coach people. So clients and even coaches themselves. And then that was sort of the genesis of the precision nutrition project. 
Really cool, man. Now, it turns out that we have a number of similarities as far as our high school days go. We were both apparently drunk and high for the majority of it. So, <laughs> this I think, is true. This is true, yeah. I think folks might be surprised to hear that because you are so successful now. So, how did you begin to sort of turn things around in that regard? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean um, as you said, you know, I. I Midway through my high school years, I just, I think, is a coping mechanism for self-esteem issues and some of the other stuff that was going on. I got into drinking and drugs and, and hang, hung out with uh, whatever, as people say, with air quotes, the wrong crowd. And um, a friend of mine was asking me this the other day because she read the intro to my book, which talks about some of this. And she was like, well, I knew about that car crash story, but I didn't know that your friends all got arrested later that night. And I can tell the story in a second, but I, but it, and then it, then it triggered a memory for me. And I was like, Oh, that would have been the fourth time that I got arrested with those guys. Wow. Now, I guess three was enough. Cause what ended up happening was, um, you know, as, as we did, we were going out one night and we were drinking and had, had done drugs. And, um, we were driving a car home. So my friend was driving and I was in the back seat and uh, long story short, we essentially got into a car accident uh, with ourselves. No one else was hurt, thankfully. And if anyone's listening and judging us for being idiots, yes, <laughs> that's <laughs> true. <laughs> um, but uh, but, you know, we were we were riding. A, it was nighttime and we were riding on this road and we ended up hitting a curb and doing a couple three sixties across the road. And I knew this area really well. And it was an embankment off the one side with a lot of trees. So I was certain we were going to die, um, in, in my mind. And I, I remember grabbing my friend, Chris, he was sitting next to me. I pushed him down. I kind of climbed over him a little bit and then, um, and just kind of, you know, trying to protect him a little bit and, and myself. And then, uh, I remember just bracing for, you know, the end. And I also remember like a movie, like the, my life flashing before my eyes, I saw all these scenes of, Myself as a kid and growing up and my, my brother was very close with. Um, and, my, and the last scene as I went through this sort of montage of uh, life events was um, my parents like looking down at me being lowered into the ground with like grief and shame. Because, you know, this is their teenage son ending his life drunk and high crashing a car like an idiot, you know. And that was a big wake up call for me. So, uh, thankfully we, we didn't die. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, we, uh, we narrowly missed smashing head on a tree. We, we ended up between two trees with the side view mirrors knocked off. And, uh, that it, it was literally like a one second wake up, you know, where, where I looked around, I saw these guys, they were panicking because we were going to get in trouble. And I was like, oh, there's no amount of like seeing the police tonight that um, is going to make me feel anything compared to what I just felt. Right. So I helped them get the car back on the road. I just decided to walk home that night. They got arrested later on that night. Um, and uh, that, that was it for me. That was the turnaround. So I was a terrible student. I was always getting into trouble. Um, and this was a, a decision to do something different and take a different path. And I stopped hanging out with those guys that night. I stopped drinking and doing drugs essentially that night. Um, and that's when I kind of threw myself into working out and, and this field. And I was really lucky because uh, the part of this kind of story arc that you rarely hear is that when you give up your coping mechanisms um, and all your friends, it's actually quite lonely. You have nothing else to do with your time. And so um, that's where I guess the gym found me. Um, I started working out. I got mentorship, which saved my life at that point. And uh, my mentor sort of, he, he was a bodybuilder, so he taught me how to build my body. But then he also would give me books to read and made me promise to go to university or community college to get up my grades. And so that really became this big turning point for me. And, and it's why I'm in this field that I am today, because it basically saved my life. And, and um, it just feels resonant with my soul to, to be in here helping other people the way that I was helped.
So inspiring, man. That's such a cool story. Now, as we sort of move forward, you were running a massive company. Precision is a huge company. Now, how did you sort of manage to ebb and flow with the busyness of it all, but also take care of your health, spend time with your family, friends, get enough sleep and all that good stuff? How did you balance all of that? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I... I, I like the story arc of my professional life has been pretty amazing. Um, and I feel super grateful and lucky for it. You know, I really laid the groundwork for, for the precision nutrition project. And I, I co-founded PN with Phil Caravaggio, who's been my very long time friend and partner, um, in, the, in the business project. Um, and we laid the groundwork before, uh, I was married to my wife, Amanda, and before we had any children. So, I, I mean, I put in a lot of hours in the early days. And so life in those days was working on the PN project and taking care of my health and fitness. That Those were the only two things. I didn't really balance the so- social life, if, if you want to say that, you know. Um, fortunately, my friends were the people that I worked with and I liked them and I, I love them. And so it was, I got social through that, but really the two big priorities in my life were this, this project I was really passionate about and just taking care of myself. And those were the two things I, I did. Everything else was a no. So I probably didn't have as many adventures as maybe some other people might want to have. I didn't spend time with friends or cultivate a, a rich community as much um, outside of work. Um, as other people might like or want. Um, but fortunately, that didn't last very long because the company started to take off. Um, we were able to hire more help, so I didn't have to put in those kind of hours. So by the time we started, Amanda and I started having children, and we have four now, um, I was able to work a normal human <laughs> work week, you know, uh, the and even cut back on travel because in the early days I traveled. I know two years before our, our first daughter was born, I was on the road about 25 Uh, events a year. Um, And then that's when I was like intentionally, if we're going to have a family, I'm going to have to cut this back. So the next year was 12 um, on purpose. The year after that was six. And that was the year our daughter was born. And then it's basically been two or three events a year ever since. So I think, you know, it's part of this sort of master strategy that I had in place, you know, fortunately some of the, the right things happened in terms of growth and hiring and all that. Um, but, uh, the balance has come from having a plan in place in advance of, of needing it. So this sort of, uh, redistribution of my hours and my travel and, you know, how I'm going to have an impact. Um, and, and that's really continued to this day. The, the activity, the exercise I think is relevant though, regardless of your story, you know, and I write, write about this in the new book, Um, I think that there are always a million things to do and there always feel like a million opportunities, especially as you start to develop a reputation and and do good work. The, The crux of it all then is figuring out how to ruthlessly prioritize your time to spend, um, your time only on the most important things and then spend the rest of the time resting and recovering or uh, whatever you need to feel enriched in your life. So for me, you know, I have three priorities written down. They're posted in my office so I can see them every single day. And it's um, uh, be a present uh, parent and partner. It's one. Uh, Two is um, take care of myself through exercise, healthy eating, time in nature, uh, stress management and good sleep. And then three is um, focus my professional energy on whatever the most important project at the time is. And it's, it's kind of the same as I talked about earlier. These three things are the North Star. There's literally everything else is a no. And and this isn't just a philosophical position. Like I say no to a lot of cool things. <laughs> I'm invited to do neat stuff. Hey, do you want to go ride dune buggies in Mexico for a week with the guys? I would love to do that. That sounds super fun, but I can't because I look at my list, right? Is this time with family? Is this making me a present parent and partner? Is this working on my most important professional project? And is this taking care of my eating, movement, 
stress management and and sleep and recovery? And the answer is no. If I if I'm even on this last one, if I go down there with the guys, we won't sleep very much. You know what I mean? It won't be recovery. It'll be the opposite. Um, so that's that's kind of my filter for how to quote unquote balance things. You know, it's it's really not balance. It's just wait all of your energy and time on the important things and literally think about nothing else if possible. And sometimes it's not possible, right? Because crises or disasters or things come up in life that you do have to think about and put on the front burner for a while. Um, but peacetime, as I, I think of it, a state of your life, it should be just super clear what you need to spend time on and you just don't do anything else. I love that, man. And I love the your thoughts on balance because it's sort of a bit of an illusion. I mean, you're starting your business. I have a client that's starting a business at the moment and she was asking me how I balanced everything when I started mine. And I told her to be honest that I didn't, I, I, I wasn't very social for the first two to three years. I wasn't doing much else other than similar to you working out, taking care of myself that way, and then just sort of working on the business. So I think that's an important point to drive home as far as instead of thinking about balancing everything, just thinking about what your priorities are and then adjusting accordingly. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing that I often think about is like, what's the question behind the question? So if if I had a client ask me like, oh, man, how do you balance all this stuff? What I really want to know is um, how are you feeling in your life that makes you ask that question? Right. So are you feeling frazzled and uh, confused and overwhelmed? Is there too much stuff going on? You know, so people usually don't ask that question. Gosh, how do you get balance when they're feeling it themselves, right? So if if you're feeling out of balance, it's great to dig in and, and say, well, what's causing that? And for a lot of people, it's just doing way too much stuff. You know, even within like if, if you take my approach and narrow it down to two or three priorities, right? Uh, and let's say you zoom in, like let's talk about professional. And then let's talk about, oh, I've got my own business. I'm an entrepreneur. And I need to do marketing, uh, let people know about what I'm doing. And then you zoom in, you're like, well, should I do paid ads or radio ads or Facebook? Or should I write articles or should I go speak? Like even within any you know, subset of activities, it can be overwhelming. And that's when, again, ruthless prioritization comes in. You know, it's what is the thing, the one thing that you can do, you know, you 80-20 this, as they say. Uh, you put all your energy into this thing that's going to have the biggest impact. And then you know what you do with the rest of the time? Have a nap. Go rest. Recover for the next hard effort. In other words, pick the fewest number of things that have a chance to make a real difference. And then go all in on them. Do them really extraordinarily well. Uh, as they say, don't half-ass them. Use your whole ass, you know? And, and, um, and, and then... then then just rest in the in-between times until the next effort comes up where you're going to have to use your whole ass again. So it's this is the antithesis of how I see a lot of people operating. They operate with like this frenetic kind of frantic energy trying to do far too many things and doing none of them remarkably well. And if we think of, let's say, business to continue with this example, you know, I, I really simplify business as three things. One is you have to know what people want, like what they really, really want and are willing to pay for. Two is you have to build something remarkable to deliver that. And then three is you have to tell everyone about it. That's all any business that's been successful ever has to do or has done. And if you do those three things well, the probability of you succeeding is really high. So really tracing that back to this idea, how do you find balance? Um, well, the answer is you have to do these things well, right? And so in the business example, it's do fewer things, but make sure they're what people want they're remarkable and that everyone knows about it. And, uh, and so that sort of, it's this sort of maps to this larger life philosophy of mine, which is ruthless prioritization. Uh, things have to earn their rent. Uh, man. Now, as far as your top three priorities, you have being uh, a great husband, parent, 
Um, and then number two is sort of taking care of yourself. Now, are those like one A and one B? Because I feel like those feed into each other a lot, being that care of yourself, the better you can show up for your family, essentially. Mm-hmm. So are, do those, are those sort of one A and one B or how do you think about your top two? Yeah. I mean, I, I think about them more like, um, they don't necessarily have to be balanced uh, in any given day, but over the course of time, like every, any given week, you try and get all three done really well. And if, if you can't in a given week, then it's over the course of a month. So you have to think not only in terms of things, but you have to think in terms of timelines. Uh, and I think everything has to be thought of this way. So for example, you know, we just launched the Changemaker book. Uh, November 5th uh, was the launch date. So, you know, the week before that, the week of and the week after, I just had to have a chat with my family and say, hey, listen, you know, that book that I've been working away on for two years, well, it's coming live. So I have to really be present to help launch that and get it off the ground and make sure everyone who it could possibly help is going to learn about it. So for the next couple of weeks, and we have the next three weeks, so starting this week, next week, launch week, and the week after, I'm going to be really focused on that, which means I may not be able to do as much fun stuff with you all. Uh, I may be in my office more than usual. Uh, I may even miss a few workouts along the way, although I'll try not to do any of those things. I I might. Uh, But after that, then I'm going to invest back in these other things. So again, it's, it's being really, really intentional about what the timelines look like. Um, and, and also really defined if you're just like, it's a busy time for me. Uh, that's too vague. Uh, it, it, it'll be a busy time forever. If that's your paradigm, it's just these three weeks, I need to invest more time in this than you're used to me investing. Um, I need you to know that, is, is there anything that you need during this time? Um, and when I come out of these three weeks, know that I'm going to reinvest in these other things. So I don't really have them as, you know, um, one, two, three within any given day or a week. It's just, you, you know, you, you're constantly evaluating your life and the needs of each of those three things. And then they may shift position. So like during those three weeks, the project that I'm working on may jump to number one. And family and self-care drop down. Uh, the, in the summer, for example, we have a cottage. And so our whole family goes away to the cottage. And during the summer, family jumps up to number one and stays there for those few months. Uh, because all the kids are off school. We're all home together. Uh, our cottage is in a beautiful place. So that's like really the main priority. And then I have to tell the people that I'm working with the same, which I do. Hey, for the next three months, I'm going to be at the cottage. The kids are off school. So um, this work project is probably going to bump down. So you're going to feel me present a little bit less. But when I get back in the fall, that's going to change again. And so it's really just this constant dialogue, expectation setting with the people that you care about and the things that you care about. And, uh, constantly reshifting and rebalancing things, if you want to use that word, um, so that what needs to get done gets done when it does, but that you don't get sucked into the black hole of that being the pattern for the rest of your life. In a sense, man, and I really like the idea of zooming out a little bit and not focusing on the day-to-day so much because I feel like that takes the pressure off in a sense. Now, this sort of leads into my next question really nicely. I'd love for you to share your thoughts on Hard work, because you saw your parents immigrate to the U.S., work extremely hard, yet not necessarily reap all of the rewards that some folks may think automatically should come along with just simply a strong work ethic. So can you elaborate on us on that for us, John? It it becomes a bit of a, a comical cliche to talk about the grind culture or whatever, right? Like, you know, who who are the heroes of this that people position in this way, the Gary V's and, and folks like that. Um, and, uh, but I, th- I think there's something like pervasive and, 
in in the thinking around this idea of hustle and grind because it comes up like when I talk about you know identifying your purpose and your unique abilities and your values when I talk about like ruthlessly prioritizing working really hard on on what you're going to work on and then resting um, people inevitably always feel like they have to correct me and be like yeah but you have to work really hard I don't want these young generation Xers or whatever whatever the upcoming generations are going to be uh thinking it's easy that you just need to like, you know, say what your purpose is and then go work on that a little bit. And then it's going to be happiness and sunshine and rainbows. Like people will call me out on this. And, uh, and I'm like, Oh, it's so interesting because at the base of all this is the idea that you have to grind really hard if you want to be successful. And what I think often goes unquestioned is the idea that that is not sufficient for success. And again, this comes from my life experience. You know, I grew up around immigrants, a lot of them, and they worked so damn hard, way harder than these people who are like these gen whatevers don't don't get what it's like to hard work hard. I'm like, no, you don't get what it's like to work hard. I grew up around the hardworking people who had like three jobs and never got to see their families. Um, I, that's that's hard work right there. And they were not rewarded for it. Um, now. Let me say very specifically, big financial or entrepreneurial rewards per se. You know, many of them were rewarded with uh, escaping a country that would have persecuted them or killed them. Uh, Just extreme poverty. So they were rewarded in in some way. So they felt like they won in many ways. They worked really hard for it. Um, But they're not getting this financial entrepreneurial success that people are saying right now the grind leads to. So for me, it's just like that is may be necessary. I'm not even sure. Like working hard may be necessary, but uh, strategy is way more important. <laughs> you know, you have to be pointed in the right direction. You have to make the smartest actions. And uh, if you do that, I think you can scale back on this. You know, you got to grind. That's just what it's all about. The people who work the hardest get the biggest paycheck or whatever. Um, So that's really my take on this. And I think the same is true with like nutrition and and exercise. You know, it really becomes a point of diminishing returns when you get so serious about working so hard at that particular goal where you don't incorporate rest, recovery and rejuvenation into the mix. And I think it's the same is true in work. You know, we kind of get it in fitness, but not everyone does, you know, it's during the time between hard efforts that you rebuild, right? That you get stronger, that you, you know, protein synthesis happens, that you regenerate your glycogen stores. It's during the rest that the adaptation occurs, not during the work, right? So the work triggers the adaptation, but it doesn't cause it. So I think the same is true with generally uh, working towards most of the other things in our life. You know, you need that rest and rejuvenation and recovery period. Um, without it, the growth doesn't happen. So that's kind of my take on, on hard work. It's, it's maybe necessary, and I still say maybe because uh, there might be a way with great strategy to work a lot less hard than everyone else and still do better. Um, but what is absolutely, requ- absolutely required is intelligent efforts, uh, high probability bets, if you want to call them that. What should I do next with my business or my career or in my parenting or in my training? Uh, what do, You have to ask, what do I think has a chance of working? And these are like my two fa- famous questions at work, and I'm sure everyone's so consistently annoyed with them, is when people come up with ideas at the very end, we're like, okay, cool. Is that the best idea we can come up with? All right, so now I have these two questions to ask. Does anyone in the room think it's actually going to work? So let's go around the room and talk about that, think it's going to work or not, and then what's it going to break? So th- this is how I think about all these things. What Can we stack the deck in our favor? Uh, what's the high probability move here? And the high probability move to have success in whatever your endeavor, eating, exercise, business, is um, strategy, to have the right plan. Um, it's not just work hard, start running into walls, and hopefully you'll break through one one day. Man, that's super insightful. And I've heard you recommend and chat about the book Range a number of times recently. Can you explain a bit about why you found that book so valuable? 
Yeah. yeah so um, I, uh, it, it wasn't even on my radar. One of my good friends, he's actually a, a former athlete that I used to coach um, named Steve Messler. He was on uh, the 2010 USA bobsled team that won gold uh, at the Olympics. And um, he's gone on to found a really great uh, nonprofit called Classroom Champions. So he came out to stay with us at our cottage this summer. And he brought this book as a gift because he's good friends with David Epstein, who wrote the book range. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, this wasn't on my radar. It wasn't on my list. So, um, you know, I I was going to put it on the maybe to read one day pile, you know, and he was and uh, I'm like, cool, man, thanks. And, and I could tell that he, he could tell that I was like, thanks for another book. Um, and so he was like, no, man, read this. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. And so that just bumped it up to read it next, right? And so uh, the book is essentially about this idea. And there's so many themes in the book. It's so, I mean, it's probably one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. Um, but, uh, but the theme is... Uh, why sort of generalists triumph in a world of specialization. So the notion, I mean, he starts with athletic examples, like, you know, and music examples. So the idea that we love or the media loves to highlight examples of people who like started specializing in a thing when they were very young, developed some mastery early on, and then went on to be, you know, world beaters. So like Tiger Woods is a great example. You know, he was like, hustling guys uh for games of golf when he was like five years old or whatever he was beating grown men at the golf course we love that the idea of like these prodigies who have otherworldly gifts and then go on to do something with it we love chess prodigies and all these kind of things and so he's like and then what we end up doing is creating narratives about what it takes to be successful You need to start specializing early. You need to put in your 10,000 hours and then you can achieve mastery. Just look at Tiger Woods. Just look at these uh, tennis prodigies. Just look at these um, chess prodigies. And he very effectively argues that that is a extremely poor model of what it takes to succeed in the world we live in today. Um, Now, it's not a poor model for a specific set of um, set of activities, tennis, um, golf, um, chess are those kinds of activities. He calls them sort of kind world, um, activities. And it's where the rules are well known. It's where they're not going to change during the activity. It's where you get immediate feedback from your performance. Like, you know how you're doing after each stroke of that golf club. Um, so, In conditions like that, where you can actually learn rapidly, where you know the rules and they don't change, and by practicing scenarios over and over and over again, you can develop a real mastery, Um, early specialization is probably useful. But almost every other problem in the world isn't like that. The rules aren't well known. They do change often, often while you're participating. And feedback is so delayed that it's easy to develop superstitions instead of real learning. And so he just argues in this book so brilliantly that what may be required instead is this idea of range, a vast life tool bag, if you want to call it, toolkit of all kinds of experiences that help you make decisions in wicked world problems, right, where the rules change and feedback isn't immediate. And so he really celebrates Uh, The folks who uh, maybe have said things in their life like, um, I don't really come from this field. Uh, I have a really weird and diverse set of interests and background. I mean, I studied this and then I went to this and I went to this. People are wondering when I'm ever going to grow up and pick a thing. Uh, It kind of celebrates people like that because a lot of people who don't find that one thing they're going to do until a little bit, quote unquote, later in their life, tend to catch up really quickly and exceed the people who did early specialization. And again, he talks about this in the context of school and education and in the context of sport and in the context of all kinds of uh, like uh, patent technology and, and innovation. And so anyway, I, I just think it was a tremendous book that really highlights this idea that, uh, 
skill and wisdom in answering questions and solving problems often comes from people who have a diverse background of experiences, who can see the world through different lenses and bring to bear all of that weird stuff that they never thought would have connected um, in an interesting way to solving new challenges. I couldn't agree more. And I think that, you know, if we sort of look at some of the most interesting people, or at least the most interesting people to interact with, they can talk about a really wide range of topics. They can talk a little bit about everything and they don't necessarily, or they aren't necessarily able to delve incredibly deep on one topic, but they can talk a a little bit about everything and it makes for a really interesting conversation and interaction. Yeah, they're often called, uh, this is a model I share in the book too, the T-shaped learner, which is, or the the T-shaped curriculum is what I call it. So, you know, um, I use it as a way of helping people as they think about plotting out their career, um, become future them, the person they want to be. And, um, you know, you bring up the the thing about interestingness. And so, uh, people have often said that, you know, like Ernest Hemingway is a great example of sort of like a famous American, uh, person who had a really broad T. So the way to think about it is if you look at a T, the horizontal line across the top would represent all the things that you can comment intelligently on, have had some experience in. It's the area where you don't have to be deep. But you're broad. Your range of knowledge is broad. And then there's one area where you're very deep, right? And that might be your specialization. Um, you think about that in terms of my career. You know, I have a PhD in exercise and nutritional biochemistry. So that's where I went really deep. But to do the things that I've done since, you know, I've had to learn about communication. I've heard to, had to learn about public speaking. I've had to learn about business. I've had to learn about coaching psychology. So there's this wide range of things you know, that I've had to learn to become the kind of professional I wanted to become. And so Hemingway is just a great example because people used to comment about this uh, when they would meet him or or interact with him. You know, um, he could talk about all kinds of things. And if you know anything about Hemingway, you know, he was an avid fisherman and he was a war correspondent and journalist and he was um, a hunter and he was a boxer and he was like proficient at this really wide range of things. But then he was just a masterful writer as well. So to your point, you know, some of the most interesting people are these people who pay attention to both the horizontal stroke of the T and the vertical one, too. And um, now that's not to say that uh, people who only have the vertical aren't important. Uh, They are. They're just important for a very narrow range of things. Right. And they're not going to be the best problem solvers per se, unless it's in this specific area that they're trained in and even sometimes not there. You know, I always think back one of the first big um, presentations I did when I was in my undergrad was in a philosophy of science course um, talking about the sort of discovery of the double helix DNA strands. And um, I still remember like this was a big argument in the philosophy of science, which is some of these big innovations in scientific discovery come from people working outside the field. So Watson and Crick are the, the guys who you know discovered the DNA double helix, but neither of them were geneticists. They they worked in they worked in science, but not in this specific field. So there's all these people who specialized on this one thing and they never, they didn't find it, you know, but people coming in with just like, they, they know science well enough. They know the methodology well enough, but they have a different perspective on how they look at, you know, the cells and chemistry and biology. Uh, they see this thing that people who are so entrenched don't. So it's really, I think it's a really interesting life lesson about what, what may be important if, if we want to uh, be able to solve problems and um, see the world more broadly and develop wisdom. Absolutely, man. Now, shifting gears a little bit, you were fairly recently diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, and I'm super curious to know, what's your experience been like with that? What did you implement in order to manage it or put your condition into remission? Yeah, I mean, it's a weird, I'm still going through discovery process here, so I won't pretend to be an expert on it. But, you know, I was diagnosed, I mean, it started uh, about a year and a bit ago, I, I started developing these sort of skin lesions. So these red, 
dry, scaly, itchy patches at various places in my body, on my head, like the temple areas, my lower back, and different areas, and like under my armpits. And and so I was like, what? What is this? What is this rash? Right. So I went and got out of checked out a bunch of docs, and I was eventually diagnosed with psoriasis and and um which is an autoimmune condition where basically your immune system attacks your skin and um and then the doc asked me like um now oftentimes with psoriasis comes psoriatic arthritis which is this similar condition the same autoimmune process attacks your joints so do you have any joint pain and i was like well yeah, come to think of it, I, like my knees hurt really, really bad. And I have a real struggle with leg workouts and managing my weekly training volume around lower body work. But I just presume that was a function of like too many heavy squats and dumb training when I was young. Um, and uh, and the doc was like, well, describe your symptoms and when they came on and all this. And, I, and she's like, yeah, yeah, you have psoriatic arthritis as well. So I was like, OK, great. A fun double whammy here. So then, you know, I did what I do, which is a ton of self-experimentation guided by experts that I seek out. So I sought out a rheumatologist and a dermatologist and also a naturopath and a host of people who just look at this problem differently, kind of like I, I talked about earlier. You know, the medical community, the conventional medical community is like, oh, you have psoriasis. Well, you have it for life. Take this, you know, corticosteroid, rub it on your skin when it flares up, um, and that's your treatment. And it, it's effective. It's probably the most effective documented treatment, but it doesn't address any of the root cause. It's just makes the rash go away at the skin level, you know, and, um, that wasn't good enough for me. So I started experimenting with things. So one of the first things I did was an autoimmune protocol diet, which is a pretty restrictive eating strategy. That's kind of like an elimination diet. You basically eliminate most things leaving in, we'll call them sort of non, uh, allergenic proteins or the proteins that don't cause uh, allergies or immune responses in most people. So you're basically left with a bunch of meats, animal proteins, and then uh, vegetables, uh, but excluding a host of nightshades and uh, some other things. So I, I started following this and um, it did nothing for my skin lesions, but I had a miraculous result in terms of my joints. Um, literally all this tremendous knee pain that I was having was gone in about two to three weeks. I mean, like it was to the point where I couldn't like I'm a fairly strong guy who's been training heavy for years and I, I really couldn't squat like more than 135 pounds pain free. And uh, within a couple months, I had 350 on my back for multiple reps. So it was a pretty dramatic turnaround. Now, it's not the strongest I've ever been, but going from 135 with complete like knives being stabbed into my knees pain to uh 350 on my back for a few reps with no pain is is pretty remarkable um and then uh then i started looking into the skin stuff and uh the most evidence-based like non you know medication treatment is uvb light which is basically what comes from the sun there's uva uvb UVA is what tans us, but it's also the thing that has the highest um, relationship with cancer. Um, UVB is what burns us, so we don't get a tan from it, um, but it has a lower relationship with cancer. It also happens to be the wavelength that uh, causes most of the vitamin D production in your skin, which has a really powerful effect on skin conditions like eczema, psoriasis, and, and others. So I bought a UVB light and I started using that. And so this combination right here of a uh, autoimmune diet and UVB light has kept most of my symptoms at bay. Now, I'm still in a discovery process because it's, it's really interesting. You know, our, our family spends the winter in Arizona and we spend the summer at our cottage. And when we're away in Arizona or at our, our cottage, uh, I don't have to do any of the treatment and I don't get any uh, problems with my psoriatic arthritis or psoriasis. Uh, when I come back home, though, they flare up again. So right now I'm trying to discover, like, what's causing that? Is it the season or is it thing in our home? Like, is there some 
allergen that's triggering all this for me. So again, not an expert. It's just something I'm discovering in real time here. Um, so for example, one thing we're testing our home for is mold, uh, because there may be a relationship between having mold in your house, being hypersensitive to it, that sensitivity causing an immune reaction, and then that over response, uh, leading to an autoimmune condition type of thing. So I'm still unpacking it all right now. Cool, man. Did you notice any changes in your digestion when you started to switch to the autoimmune protocol or when you started to implement the light therapy, anything like that? Um, it, well, actually, it got worse at first because um, I think I, when, I, when I switched over, I mean, I still train hard, so I, I need a lot of calories. So if you're just eating protein and vegetables, uh, it's easy to start losing weight pretty fast. And I didn't want that. I wanted to actually maintain or even gain a little bit of muscle. So I was throwing lots of extra calories in from fruits and things like that. And I discovered I might be a little sensitive to food maps, which is a, a type of a carbohydrate that's high in certain uh, fruits and vegetables that um, that can cause you know digestive discomfort. So I was just I was like really uncomfortable at first, you know, so you just think like, oh, well, you're eating really quote unquote clean protein and veggies. That must be great for your digestion. Well, it's not. You can't make those kind of overly simplistic comments, right? Or, or, uh, judgments. Uh, and so for me, I was like, oh man, this is terrible gastrointestinal discomfort. So, um, I had to start dropping out food maps. And once I did that, then things have been awesome from a digestive perspective. And also, you know, I should mention that once I was on the autoimmune protocol and all the symptoms were resolved, I didn't want to just eat vegetables and protein for the rest of my life or else feel like my knees were going to blow out. You know, I mean, that's, that's no way to live. Like I'm 45. Uh, and if I live to 100, I've got 55 more years. So the idea that if I ever ate not a protein or a vegetable, that my knees would be terrible again, isn't something I want to live with for 55 years. So I started introducing foods back in to see which ones may have caused the problems. And what I narrowed, narrowed it down to was dairy and soy are the two big ones for me. Uh, I often say like, I'm so grateful that gl Gluten was one of them because I don't want to give that up for life. For those who so have, have to, to that, 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 that sucks. sucks. Um, <laughs> for me, it was just, just dairy, dairy, dairy and soy. soy. You know? uh, and so now I just I literally just have to avoid those two things, and then uh, I'm pretty good. But what I found was that I, I felt just great on the autoimmune protocol that I still follow it about 80% of my meals, um, just eating loads of good quality protein and lots and lots of vegetables. But like, I mean, I'm not a nutritional robot. Like I, I like certain foods in particular. I really like ice cream. Can't have dairy ice cream. So I eat dairy free ice cream all, like almost every day. Every day I train, which is usually five times a week. So usually I just have a bowl of ice cream with some mixed nuts in it and frozen banana and some dark chocolate and usually some almond butter. And that's what I'll have like uh, as my dessert after my uh, post-workout meal and again, it's a way to help me get more calories. And I share that just to say, like, um, as I went through this experimentation, I realized, like, eating clean as, like, a moral kind of statement isn't the goal here, right? It's, it's, there was an outcome I was after. I want to eat in a way that promotes my health and good body composition. And I want to eat in a way that helps with my, um, my autoimmune condition. So I'm going to experiment until I find the balance, right? It's, and, and uh, I'm there now, which is really great. Of ice cream. I don't tolerate dairy well either. Have you tried coconut bliss or what sort of dairy free ice cream? I have, have I have, have yes, yes, but, but my, 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 I've tried them all, my friend. Like, <laughs> uh, I've, I've been, been doing this for a year. So, so if you imagine 52 weeks, five ice creams a week, so over 250 ice creams this year. Um, I've tried every one that I can get my hands on of dairy free. And my number one, number one pick is called So Delicious. Um, they have the widest range of flavors and um, th they're just the best one, hands down. And, I, and, and now, I mean, I, I have a hard time saying this sometimes because I really love Ben and Jerry uh, and they have a dairy free. But I think So is better. And it's also fewer it's a lower caloric load. I've tried the Haagen-Dazs one. It's good too. Breyers has one. 
Um, but so delicious is still my number one pick. Um, but like everything else, one of my closest friends, Tim, uh, he, uh, it, it causes like horrible effects on his stomach. Whenever he eats it, he's like got cramps and goes and has diarrhea. So it's different for everyone. Right. And it's part of this, uh, journey we're all on finding some of the things that work for us and some of the things that don't. Yeah, totally. The coconut products can be hit and miss for people. It just depends, hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, and, and, and so, so is um, they have a, they have coconut, um, they have cashew, and they have almond uh, versions, right? So so the base can either be like coconut milk, almond milk, or cashew milk. And so uh, my favorite ones from So Delicious are the are the cashew ones talk about an awesome little feedback exercise that you do with your kids to be the best dad you can be. So can you share that with us? Yeah. I mean, um, as you'll notice, like, uh, I, I'm just really, really high on strategy, on clear thinking and on being intentional about everything that you do in your life. And, and so if, if my number one priority in life is, or at least during a large portion of the year is going to be, be a better parent. Um, it's just like if you're building a product for your business, you can't possibly know how to do this on your own. You, you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. So Ray Dalio, who's sort of been a mentor to our business and to Phil, my partner, uh, he's a billionaire hedge fund manager, wrote this book, Principles, uh, that was, I think, 2018 Amazon's book of the year. Um, he shares you know, this idea that um, the best ideas aren't in your own head. You know, and, and for me, I extend that out to the best ideas come from the interface between you and other people. Um, it's, it's not in other people's individual heads either. It's when you put smart heads together that the best things come out. And that requires questioning and curiosity and feedback. So I often teach this to my business clients like, hey, how do I know? Like, how do I build an awesome product? I'm like, you don't build an awesome product. You plus loads of feedback plus other smart people builds an awesome product. Um, so how do I be an awesome parent? You don't be an awesome parent. You plus feedback and the ideas of other smart people and the interface between them becomes an awesome parent. So for me, part of that process is actually sitting down with our children and asking them what I can do to be a better parent for them. Uh, so I've been doing this for a few years. Um, I started with each child when they're uh, three. I, I feel like that's sort of the the age, depending on their own development, where they can answer a question like that in earnest, like they get what you're talking about and they can maybe give you some answers. Um, I don't expect the three-year-old's uh, answer to be profoundly changing, um, but uh, sometimes they are surprising. And also we get in the practice of doing that. Um, and so for me, there's a couple advantages to doing this. Uh, one is the simple act of doing it shows them that you care. So independent of whether there's any action taken from their feedback, you asking, is you being a better parent? So that's part one. Uh, the second thing is um, when they do give you feedback, uh, it's usually surprising. I, I mean, I've never gone into one of these sessions and I usually have an opinion of what I think they're going to say. And I've never come out with there being 100 percent overlap. They usually say some things I didn't know they were thinking which that's golden. That's exactly what I need, right? Not what's in my head, but the interface between what's in theirs and mine. And then the third thing is if, so you learn. And the third thing is if you actually take action on it, you, not only are you sort of helping serve their, their needs, um, but you're showing that what they say matters and that you're willing to take action on it. So it's not just the fact that I did more of X. It's the fact that I wanted to do more of X, that they asked and they got more of X. So um, I'll give you an example. This past summer leading up to the summer, you know, I said summer is a very deep family time where I invest a lot of time in that. Um, it's certainly number one. Um, I sat down with the boys. Uh, we have two sons. They're seven and five. And we had this quite they, they love to do things together. So we did it, the three of us. And uh, again, some of the answers were a little bit surprising to me. Um, I thought they were going to say certain things, but uh, what what they did say is, uh, well, we think it would be awesome if you worked a little less and had more fun with the kids. Those were their answers. 
And the first one's surprising because like I sold my shares of Precision Nutrition in 2017. So I work less than almost anyone I know. Right. You know? right. So, so your first instinct is to be like, um, well, what do you kids know about hard work? You know, maybe I need to take you around to show you how other daddies work so that you'll know that the amount this daddy works is less. But that's silly, right? That's way too focused on me and, you know, teaching a lesson or whatever. Uh, it may have been like, it may have flashed through my head for the first little bit. But then I sat back and said, okay, well, if I, if it's true that I do work less, um, they don't feel that. So how can I reorient my day so that they do feel that? It may not actually be working less that's required. It may be that I need to be very intentional about them knowing that the time that I'm spending with them is not work or that I need to spend time working when they don't want to be with me. You know what I mean? And when they do want to be with me, be available for that and and have some clear expectations around what that means. So I really took a lot of action on these two things over the summer. By the end of the summer, our relationship was different. It was way better. It was really, really strong and close and amazing and exactly what you would want for as a parent. So anyway, this is, it's, it's just part of this process of becoming a better parent. Saying you want to be a better, better parent is meaningless. Um, unless you do something about it, but doing whatever occurs to you in your own head isn't much better because you don't know what you don't know. Uh, the only way to do great stuff or improve or try and make a difference is to ask other people and then get ideas from other people. So that's really kind of how I, I how I approach this. And again, I'm not a parenting expert. Uh, I'm just a guy who wants to do a good job. And I, and I happen to know how to do a good job from other parts of my life, namely professionally, you know, like when it's time to create a product, I need to ask people what they want more of and what they want less of in very specific ways. And I have to talk to other smart people about how I can deliver it in a remarkable way. No one can do that on their own. I love that, man. I think that's so valuable. And I'm not a parent personally, but if and when I am, I would absolutely implement that. And I think that's really cool that, you know, just the power of asking questions and that transfers over into essentially any area of life. Yeah. I mean, I, I call this sort of active, compassionate listening and it comes from the co- my coaching experience as well. You know, this is, this is one of the fundamentals I think of life you know, how can you show up as a more active, compassionate listener? And, um, and listen more isn't a great piece of advice. Um, it reminds me of mindfulness, which is a trend now, you know, the idea that we need to, you need to be more mindful. That's, that's what most of the advice feels like to me. And that isn't advice. I mean, if I knew how to be more mindful, I'd probably be doing it. So you telling me to do more of it is the same as like a tall guy at a basketball court inviting you to come play. And when you can't dunk because you're only five foot six is like, dude, just jump higher. (laughs) Look how easy it is. Look, I can do it. Dunk, you know, Um, that it's the same silliness. Be more mindful. No, no, no. What do I need to do Monday at 9 a.m. to be more mindful? Give me some practices to do that. And uh, I feel the same about this idea of listening. We need to listen more. Yes, we do. But for people who don't know how, just telling them to do it is the same as telling them to dunk a basketball. They don't know how. Oh, on social media, people are just talking and everything's so divisive. We need to just listen to each other more. Great. But if we knew how, we would be. So how do we teach people to do it? And for me, it's what you said. It's asking questions. Um, I think figuring out how to be a better question asker, and again, I write about this in the book, in the reputation chapter, is the key to all this. You have to be curious, first of all, and then you have to turn that curiosity into questions. So tell me about this. Cool. What happened next? What do you think about what I can do for X, Y, or Z? Um, and this is something that came to me difficult. You know, I grew up introverted. I wasn't great around people. I didn't like being around them. It probably wasn't until my 30s, to be completely honest, that I learned if you want to be great with people, all you have to do 
is sit down in front of them and ask them stuff. That's it. I was like, like, wow, wow, this this is really magical. I sat down with this person I didn't know. And I, and I just was like, Hey, so tell me about something that you're really interested in right now. Like, what are you passionate about and spending your time on? And then they tell you about something and you're like, Oh, that's cool. Well, that reminds me of this. Cool. What do you think about this? And all of a sudden you're off to the races and all it took was you, you being curious, asking a great question and then letting, you know, what happens from there happen, which is inevitable. So this is what listening looks like. It looks like you asking questions. Yeah, I agree, man. I think curiosity is a little bit of a a superpower in a way. So how do you recommend that folks actually cultivate that if they don't feel like they have it right now? Um, Curiosity. Well, I think sometimes like curiosity is as curiosity does, right? Like if you start asking questions, um, even if you're not that curious yet, you'll find answers that make you curious. You know what I mean? Especially if you target the things that people, other people are most interested in. If you're like, Hey, I really love collecting stamps. What do you think about stamp collecting? And the other person person isn't interested in that. Then it's not going to be a great conversation. But if I find out what you're really passionate about, there's a good chance that even if I don't like that thing, there's something in your passion I can identify with. And we can talk about that. So for me, it's sometimes really just doing that initial, work of starting to try and uncover that. Like I, I'm not a surface, I'm not good at surface social interactions. Let's talk about surface things and make some jokes and stuff like that. Um, I want to have a meaningful conversation. So that's, that's why typically in social situations, if I'm in front of someone, I'm going to look for the thing that they're working on, that they're excited about, that they're passionate about, that they spend their energy and time and money on. Uh, and I'll just, and I'll just go for that. Not in a really intense way, but in a friendly way, but, um, just the starting of the questions. And again, I, in the book, I offer like a, there's a whole table of questions that you can ask clients that you can ask team members. If you're a leader that you can ask children, if you're a parent that you can ask people, if you're in a social situation, um, because I don't think that coaching leadership, parenting, and, uh, good social dynamics are any different. I think it's all the same skill being with people. And I think the crux of that skill is this thing, asking questions, looking for things that are important to people and then helping them get that. Um, it's, that's what parenting is. You know, there's, there's obviously other elements of it, discipline and things like that. But if you don't do the first, then they don't let you discipline them. Same thing with leadership. If you don't do the first, they choose not to follow, you know, and the same thing with coaching. If you don't do the first, People find another coach. So this is the cornerstone of it, I believe. Cool, man. Now, you've worked with some really big companies aside from Precision Nutrition, like Nike, Apple, Equinox, Titleist, Pro Athletes, George St. Pierre, all sorts of folks. So what are some of the biggest takeaways or what stands out as far as what you've learned via getting an inside peek into big organizations like those or with specific big name athletes? Yeah, I mean, one of the first ones that occurs to me is that we 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 usually separate um, athletes from us as other. You know, like oh, they have different problems. They're not like me. It's it's really different what they're doing from what I'm doing. Um, and and I don't think that's at all helpful. Sure, it is. They may be making more money if if that's a certain context you're looking at, or um, I don't know. They may be more famous, or uh, they may travel more. Whatever the case may be. Um, But looking at differences doesn't help anything. Um, Looking at similarities is what's really useful. I I talk about this all the time with diet, right? Being like um, plant-based versus, you know, keto, what's what's better, right? Um, And then people will fight which one's better. I'm like, no, what what are they both doing in common? Because there's people having success with plant-based and people having success with keto, I want to know what's similar about the two that's causing success in two different people or the same person if they try it in two different time courses, Um, not what's different about them. And I think about this here, uh, companies, individuals, because companies are just a collection of individuals. Um, 
is that they're really a lot like us. You know, I, I did an article about, you know, what we learned from pro athletes uh, that everyday people can use on the PN website. And um, there's there's like so many things like, for example, they have the same challenges and struggles that we do. We all have our own personal preferences. We all have time constraints and demands. Uh, we all have um, certain foods that we'll eat and we won't eat, you know. And so it's it's really this overarching principle that we're not as different as you think um, has been a big learning. Um, you know, I, the professional one came from Apple. It's one of my favorite lessons I've ever learned is, you know, when PN was a smaller company, um, we, I, I used to personally struggle all the time with this idea that, oh, well, we don't have enough money. We don't have enough help. If I only had more help and if I only had more money, um, things would be better. You know, resource constraints, basically. I was always complaining about them in my head, but it wasn't in that detached way. It was just like, gosh, life is terrible because we don't have enough help. Life is terrible because we don't have enough money. When we get more of those things, life will be great. And then I went to Apple and I'm sitting in this room with like, this company has all the resources. You know what I mean? They uh, had, had probably that year, they were the, the highest revenue company in the world. Um, and I was, and, and I'm sitting in a room with executives and they're saying the same kinds of things. If we only had more money, if we only had more people, and it was like one of the biggest liberating moments of my professional life and actually personal life too, because, um, if you can set down the idea that once you get more stuff, things will be okay or better or great, um, you can operate with what you have at any point in time and be pleased with that. You'll find a way to use those resources better. So it was totally freeing. Like while this person was complaining, my eyes were lighting up and I was just like, you don't even know how big of a gift you just gave me. And they're like, what is this crazy guy talking about? And I was like, I'm saying the same story. And if you can get to be the biggest, most financially profitable company in the world, and still have the same story, then my story isn't true and neither is yours. yours. Right. It's, it's not, not more, more people. people that you need. It's not more resources. You have all the resources. I'll, I'll never run a company as big as Apple. Um, and even if I got to that point, I would still be telling the same story like you are. I, I can put this story down now so freeing right and it also translated to other parts of my life right things and and not just about things money people help whatever but about emotions and time and all the other things right like there isn't a dearth of those or a scarcity of those in most situations like if you're listening to this podcast there's a good chance that there's no scarcity of those things in your in your life Uh, there are people in the world who have scarcities of those things but if you got good headset and you're listening to a podcast about dudes talking about health and fitness and lifestyle from your computer, you're probably not in that situation. Um, and so in that case, um, you just need to fix what's between your ears, uh, not the external conditions. Stuff, man. Now, speaking of fixing things between our ears, as we start to wrap up here, tell folks a little bit about the Changemaker book, how they can get their hands on it, as well as any social handles that they can follow you at and all that good stuff. Sure, totally. So so Changemaker and the, the subtitle is how to turn your passion for health and fitness into a powerful purpose and a wildly successful career stems from something that, um, you know, I've been thinking about for a really, really long time. You know, uh, when that individual I talked about at the top of the podcast came in and helped me out and put me on the right path, um, did those things. You know, he, he put me to work at his gym. He owned a gym. And, um, and so I started out working the front desk and as a personal trainer. So I've been in the space literally my whole adult life. And even for a few years before I was an adult. And, um, and the, the one thing I've seen is that there is a terrible turnover rate in this particular industry. Um, 40% of the people who come into it won't be here next year. And that's really sad to me because this isn't just picking a job for most of them. It's a passion 
You know, they're like, they want to do this more than anything else. They're actually um, choosing not to go in fields that they could easily make a lot more money in to come do this. And four out of 10 won't be here next year. They'll be chased out of this field to go do something they don't like as much as this. And I hate that. And part of the problem is that the field is young. And the other problem is that people just think you have to work hard and that's how you make it. And there's no blueprint or um, sort of strategy laid out for them. And so, again, I've been lucky enough to make it in this field. Um, And so I thought this was this would be a great time, especially with my transition away from ownership of Precision Nutrition, to set down all the things that I've learned over the last you know, almost 30 years in the field, you know, uh, as a coach, as a mentor, as a leader. So I spent two years putting together, again, everything I think I've learned into the format of this book. But it's not just lessons. It's also thought exercises, activities, worksheets, scripts. So things that readers can do actively, you know, because like I said earlier, um, mindfulness more isn't a great strategy, you know, but doing some practices every day can help you be more mindful. So that's, you know, work harder at your career isn't useful. You know, do these exercises, you know, discover your purpose, your unique abilities and your values. Uh, Do these specific things to build your reputation. Outline the courses that you need to get a great education moving forward. Those are useful. So that's what I wanted to put in this book. And so, um, again, you know, I spent two years on it. I'm so proud of the outcome. I'm also really happy with how it's doing. You know, we printed 40,000 copies and um, all of them are accounted for already. So we have to go back and print more. And I'm really delighted that so many people are in the place where they're ready to receive this information because I think it's going to be really helpful for them. Now, for people who don't work in the field, you know, uh, some may want to, so this is really useful for them. But even for those who don't, I think there's a lot of generally applicable career information in here. And so if you can look past the health and fitness examples, um, there's a lot to learn from it, I think. So if, if what we talked about today really resonates, I think you'll pick up a lot more of this from the book, but that's where that's at. And if folks want to follow me and, and, oh, I should also mention it's for sale at all the retailers. So you can get it online at the Amazons and things like that. You can get it at uh, a lot of bricks and mortar stores as well. And, uh, and for folks who want to follow me, they can just follow me at, uh, John Uh, that's my website or Dr. John Berardi on Facebook or Instagram. Needing to print more books is a good problem to have, man. That's awesome. I will link to all that stuff in the show notes. And I just want to really thank you for coming on the pod. I so appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thanks. I I really appreciate that. I I appreciate the conversation we had today. And, you know, hopefully uh, some of the folks who've been with us, thank you for listening to them. Uh, we're able to pick up some things that they can use in their life and maybe even pleasantly surprised that uh, we, we talked about some things they can use outside of the context of their health and fitness. I hope you guys got as much from that chat as I did. And I just wanted to summarize three key takeaways that I think were the common threads of this interview with John. The first being prioritization. So we can have anything we want. We just can't have everything we want. So it's really important to prioritize. Time is a limited resource. So just make time for the things that are the most important to you and then essentially just let everything else fall by the wayside. Number two is this idea of transfer. So there's no need to reinvent the wheel. If you've had success in one area of your life, you can use those principles in other areas of your life in order to have success. So if you have lost weight successfully, you've implemented you know, consistency, a good program, staying on track, prepping, all of those sort of things, which are principles that will help you succeed in every area of life, essentially. And the third one is just communication and asking questions. So I've been working on this a lot recently, so it's interesting that John brings it up, taking the assumption out of the equation. So instead of assuming someone is thinking something, doing something, acting a certain way because of X, Y, and Z reason, I've just been practicing asking. 
It sounds so simple, but it's been really, really effective. That is a wrap for today's interview with John Berardi. If you're interested in personalized one-on-one nutritional coaching and or workout programming, you can click the link in the show notes below or go to the website at n1fitness.com forward slash coaching. Also feel free to friend me up on Instagram and Facebook at n1fitness and Marcus Sadu. And let me know if you guys enjoyed this style of interview. It wasn't sort of the typical protein, carbs, fat, workout sort of deal. So let me know if you enjoyed it. I'm happy to do more interviews like this. I find them really, really interesting. So let me know. You can hit me up through the website, on Instagram, Facebook, all that good stuff. So I will catch you guys on the next episode. See ya.